let's talk about Lab 2 some more. It started on Friday. The Friday lecture is now up on, on YouTube. Uh, and there's a bunch of different things that have to do for, for Lab 2. As I said, on Friday we have to talk about the wave equation, which is what I'm going to do today. That's why the boards are, uh, the screens are up, because it's all chalk. Then uh, we need to talk about the audio codec um, for getting audio out. How we're going to parallelize the, the calculation, which I might get to today, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, a few other details like uh, building a bus master. Are there any questions about the, the Friday? going to build a simulated drum. It's going to be the, the, the domain over which the displacement occurs is going to be a square of, of in, in unitless dimensions of n by m. Um, Spacing, the, the model spacing is going to be the same in both directions because it makes the discretization a little bit easier. So what we need to do is we need to convert the wave equation into a form that can be mapped onto a squared grid and then solved by stepping forward in discrete time. So space is discretized into an m by n grid and there's going to be some delta t which is the discrete time that we're going to step the, the solution forward. In our case, this is going to be equal to the sample frequency of the audio co codec, which we're going to keep set at 48k hertz. So, so delta, one over delta t, 48 kilohertz. So that's uh, uh, 20 point, well, 20 point 20.8 microsecond. And this will come in, this will be, you'll need to know this later on because everything that happens for one sample time has got to be done in 20.8 microseconds. So, so we're going to be solving on a finite grid at a finite time step. As usual, then, we need to worry about aliasing in time, but you also need to worry about aliasing in space. Now, what I mean by aliasing in space, it means that if you start a solution, if you start a solution on this grid with one point that's been pulled out of the plane and then dropped, you will have put an impulse onto the, onto the, grid, the mesh, that has zero width and therefore infinite spatial bandwidth, not time bandwidth, the spatial bandwidth. So, and that will cause some instabilities and will hurt the TA's ears when you test it. And it will scream. So there's some details we need to work on, and we will. But let's just dust off those neurons and talk about the wave equation a little bit. So in 2D, we're going to have some partial of u with respect to t squared, u being the displacement out of the plane of the, of the, so if we look at this from the side then, then this is a node, this would be the direction of u, perpendicular to the plane. <clears throat> so the acceleration of the point, this is just f equals m8 dressed up, right? The acceleration of the point is going to be uh, derived, uh, related to the second derivative with respect to x plus the second derivative of u with respect to y. And we're going to put a little bit of damping <clears throat> we need a 1 over 
use c squared here to get the units right, where c is the propagation velocity of the, of the wave across the grid. And we're going to put in a little bit of damping, which will be velocity dependent, which says it's like viscosity. The faster the system is going, the heavier the, 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 the force that slows it down. And so we're going to make this proportional to the first partial of u with respect to v. In other words, the vertical velocity. <clears throat> that look familiar? Does this bring any sort of neurons back from, say, 3030 or Physics 2 or anything like that? So what we need to do is to decide how we're going to discretize this. And we're going to use a notation which is going to have three uh, indices. There's a time index. This is, this is time step un, or time step n. It's going to have a x index and a y index, i and j. So there's three indices on this. Right? A spatial, spatial grid index and a time step index. So if we do that, We can then say, all right, well, what's an approximation for partial of u with respect to x? So partial of u with respect to x is going to be, now let's do this right and say n i j, u n i j, is going to be u n i minus 1 j minus u n i j over delta x, that's the first derivative, minus u i j n minus u i plus 1 J n over delta t all over, sorry, delta x, all over delta x. So this is a second, a second difference. It is the difference of differences that gives us this, the, the second derivative. So to convert, to convert this equation to a difference equation then, to a set of algebraic equations, what we're going to have to do is to write out separately the second partial with respect to x, the second partial with respect to y, the second partial with respect to t, and the first derivative with respect to t. Yes? Can you write a little thicker? A little thicker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very thin. I don't have any thick chalk. It's have to write harder. Bear with it. Yeah. So, um, if we if we do that, we're going to. Well, I guess I should probably write it all out. Well, first of all, you notice that minus. So, let's see. This is going to reduce to u i minus 1 j n minus 2 u n i j plus u i plus 1 j over delta So we can we can do that for all of the all of the terms.
by just substituting in the correct terms for each of these. The UDT has to be handled a little differently because the, the nice thing about all of these derivatives, these second derivatives, is that they are inherently centered around the nth point and the ij point. They are symmetric around nij. That's true for the time derivative also. So, so we need a first derivative term which is symmetric around the ij point. So what we're going to do is to say that this is approximately equal to u n n plus 1 i j minus u n minus 1 i j over 2 delta t because that way we're instead of now think of this as three points in time instead of either thinking this slope or this slope what we're asking for is that slope so this is the average slope over two points but it is centered around the nth sample symbols, right? All good? All right, so, now, we can all, we can write this monstrous thing out and solve it, and I could do this for pages upon pages, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to give you the answer. And, and the answer we want is u of n u of n plus 1 i j as a function of u n u n minus 1 of i j i j. In other words, we know the step at, we know the value at u n because we were given it at time t equals zero. We know the value of n minus one because we know a velocity. The difference in the positions is the velocity. We know the, we, so we know this. We don't know this yet because we haven't calculated yet. We have to step forwards in time. So the form of a solution is going to be that given all of the u's for uh, all of the i and j's at time n, and all of the u's for spatial positions i and j for n minus one, we will step we will step forward one time step. And once we have a recurrence relation like that, then we can just keep stepping forward. So the recurrence relation is going to be. A, I think I have enough space here. But this is what you're going to program up. This is the very thing that you need to write a program to do. Is that u n plus 1 i j is going to be given by 1, yeah, oh no, the big brackets, 1 plus eta delta t over to the minus 1. So eta is the damping coefficient. Now the really big brackets. So rho, rho, oh, well it turns out that once you, we're going we're gonna to make a unitless velocity because it's all, all we need is just do things unitlessly. Rho is going to be equal to C delta T over delta X to the square 
power. And what we're going to do when we actually write the program is we're going to limit this. Zero is strictly less than rho is strictly less than 0 0.5. This is going to be a speed of propagation. It cannot be less than zero. If it's zero, it doesn't propagate at all. And on the other end, we have a limitation which says, basically, don't, don't step more than a half, you don't allow a wave to propagate more than a half a space step on any time step. Not more than half a space step on every time step, because if you do, you'll get spatial radius. So this is called the Courant stability condition. And if you violate that stability condition, again, the system will become unconditionally unstable and oscillate. So, we know what eta is. Eta is gonna be a small number. For real, for real drum heads, eta is going to be probably less than 0.01. Maybe a little bigger than that, but not much bigger, and mu maybe much smaller. Maybe as low as 0. 0.0001. Because it turns out that drum heads have a fairly high Q. Right? They're, they're, they're almost lossless. So, then we're going to multiply by. I plus one J N I plus one J plus U of time step N I minus one J plus U N I J plus one plus U N I J minus one minus four times u n i j that's the term that comes out of these second derivatives here plus the loss terms well there's also update term, which is 2 times u n i j minus, this is all inside the big brackets now, 1 minus eta delta t over 2, but not to the minus 1, just to the first power, times u n n minus 1 i j. This is the damping term. End of the big bracket. So what you're going to do at every time step then is to add up the nearest neighbors in u, subtract the center value, add in the current condition and subtract the piece which is due to damping. Now there's, there's lots of details here. One is that you're going to be using a fairly limited range fixed point, typically 1.17 fixed point. And if you add four numbers together, you will tend to overflow. Is it clear how you commute that to avoid overflow? Subtract this from one copy of that. Subtract this from another copy of that. Subtract this from another copy of that. Subtract this from another copy of that. Then add them together. 
So you're probably going to have to commute the, the, the operations a little bit to avoid over. Aha, we need an initial condition because we need to know n0 and n minus 1. So we need still need an initial condition, and we need boundary conditions. Boundary conditions and initial conditions. that, are there any questions? Again, any questions on this? So, think of it another way. Eta is going to determine how fast the solution dies off. In other words, how long does the drum sustain a tone? Rho is going to determine the pitch of the drum. Higher rho means higher speed of sound and therefore higher pitch. <coughs> Boundary condition. So on the edges of this thing, I'm going to suggest for simplicity, this is not, the, this is not unique, but I'm going to suggest for simplicity that you force all of the boundary nodes to zero. Okay, so on the boundary, the solution will never deviate from zero. Corresponding to a, a pinned, pinned drum head. The initial conditions we have to be a little more careful of because because of aliasing. But more or less, what you're going to do is to set u of n i j equal to u of n minus 1 i j, which guarantees zero velocity initially, because if the membrane didn't move in between these two time steps, it must be stationary. Therefore, that's a zero velocity condition. And then u n of i j is going to be set to something like, so this is in the x direction, 0 to x max, or to I think uh, what I called it, m. You're going to do something like this. You're going to strike the drum someplace but you're not going to strike it as a impulse function, but rather as a band-limited function. So do you, do you happen to remember what kind of function has the minimum bandwidth for given width? It's a uh, Gaussian. So you could excite this with a, a Gaussian. But in fact, a, a straight line approximation is almost good enough. So you're going to have to give the system a some sort of top hat function to, to as an initial condition. It doesn't have to be the full width of the drum, but it has to be wider than, say, five elements or so to avoid alias. Mike? What would like a, a, an actual drumstick hit look like? Well, that's a good question. It depends, um, it depends on the drumstick. 
the actual the actual distribution would be different for a padded drumstick than it would be for a sharp a sharp drumstick. But a sharp drumstick is going to be more like this, and a padded drumstick is going to be more like this. There's a, there's going to be a continuous deflection towards the drumstick but the width of it will be different and the tone will be different. Because this narrow pulse excites higher spatial modes of the drum than the wide distribution. Spatial mode, oh dear, another piece of jargon. The frequencies that the drum head produces have a relationship that looks like this, where you have a mode in the X direction, mode in the X direction, which is squared and added to the mode in the Y direction, and where MX and MY are integers, small integers. So this is going to be like, um, square root of 2, 5, uh, five over, square root of 5 over square root of 2, um, uh, numbers like that. But the, the smaller the stick, the higher, the larger these integers. What else? So, you have to have an initial condition for two values. You don't have to do this. You could make the initial position zero and give the system an initial velocity. What I see people do all the time, however, would be to set the initial position, set the initial position to some Gaussian distribution, so this is un, and then just zero un minus one. And the effect of that is to say that we're starting the drum with a large positive deflection, and oh, by the way, it's moving really fast in the positive direction, because it just moved from here to here in one time step. Therefore, on the next time step, the amplitude will be twice as tall, and you'll probably get over the bow and it'll crash. So you either start at a low amplitude or you zero the velocity by making un minus 1 equal to un, which gives, specifies zero velocity. But to make this more interesting, to make it more realistic, we're going to bend this, this linear wave equation in the direction of a nonlinear tension effect. So what we're going to make, what we're going to do here is to, it's sort of like part two of the, of the derivation, is to make rho a function of u. so that you can get high amplitude tension effects. Tension goes up as the amplitude goes up. Why, let's see, there's a bunch of questions that still have to be answered here, but first one is, 
Why 1.17 format? Why not? You're right. The audio codec, codec is uh, is in 1.15 fixed point, two complement fixed point. So this is good enough for the audio codec for sure. More importantly, I did this. I did a test in MATLAB to ask um, what would be the, what would happen if I only saved seven bits of, rather than 18 bits, what if it was just seven bits? And the answer is, it doesn't make a sound. The, the, the quantization is too coarse to catch the small changes between spatial points, and so nothing ever propagates, no sound. So what happens if we go to 10 bits? And, and the reason for doing steps of three is, oh dear, uh, the, the, lo the log base 10, the log base two of 10 is three point something. So every time you go up by three bits, you go up by one decimal digit, mas or menos. And with, with 10 bits, we get a little sound and a 10% spectral shift. Not very nice. With 13 bits, we get a little bit shorter sound than, than, full, than full length and about a 2% spectral shift. And with, and with 17 bits, I couldn't tell it from full precision. So, 1.17 is about right for getting reasonable precision. And 1.17 happens to be the size of the multiplier that's built into a DSP block. So this allows you to efficiently use the DSP <laughs> blocks. So there's three reasons. It fits the audio codec, it fits the DSP block, and it is accurate enough to make a fairly non-distorted sound. It's a happy coincidence. So last time I did a teaser say, wait, 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 what about this, this one plus Eta delta t over two to the minus one. Never fun to take reciprocals in, or to do a divide in in Verilog. It's, it's incredibly slow. It takes a lot of logic to do a divide, but there's no real reason to do a divide here. First of all, this is a constant, folks. You could just compute the reciprocal and store it, but you can even do better than. Eight is a small number, so for real drums, eight is going to be little. Delta T is of order one here because we're normalizing to time steps. So this says that eight and delta T over two is much less than one. Isn't that the same guy? Anyways, so so. As long as eta delta t is much less than one, we can Taylor expand this as approximately, and the approximation is pretty darn good, one minus 
a to delta t over 2. Okay. So you choose, you're going to choose an eta for your system that allows you to do an easy multiplication. So let's say that eta is a power of two. Your ear is a tremendously sensitive to decay rate. So why not make eta, eta be two to the minus gamma. Then, you'll be able to calculate this product by doing a shift and a subtraction. So what you'll probably specify in your program, or by flipping switches on the, on the FPGA, will be the logarithm, the negative logarithm of the damping. choose the exponent. Oh, so there's one more term then. After, if, we, if we can do this expansion, then we have 1 minus eta delta t over 2 multiplied by this value inside. So this becomes squared. So what's the Taylor expansion of that? Bring the two down in the first term of the Taylor expansion. Uh, this becomes a coefficient, and so we have approximately equal to one minus delta So whatever you choose for, for this term for the damping, you're going to shift by one less bit to do this multiplication over. in the shifts is you only have 174, 174 18 bit multipliers and you need to calculate 1600 nodes. So you don't want to use multipliers for multiplying by constants when you could do an add and a shift. The only place you absolutely have to have a multiply is p times this term. That has to be a real multiply because rho, I mean rho, I mean we should not be rho. Rho is a function of u and therefore is not a constant. The form I'm going to suggest for the the full the full workup of the of the of the const of the tension term says that you should take the square of the first derivative of all points on the surface and add them together, and that's probably too hard. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that rho effective is going to be equal to some rho zero. This is going to be the static tension in the, in the drum before you hit it. Plus an amount which is proportional to some u 
kind of the, at the uh, uh, midpoint. Times some scaling constant, which we'll call the, I think I call it in my code, TM gain squared. So you're going to, you're going to pretend that the stretch on the drum membrane is completely determined by the amplitude of the midpoint. It's clearly a crude approximation, but it's good enough for, for now. You can do better than this if you want to at a final project, but for now we'll do this. So you're going to multiply by some fairly small gain here, and you're going to have the amplitude at the midpoint then of this drum squared added to rho effective. That is not another multiplier for every point in the grid. That is one multiplier for the whole grid. Because this is one value of rho effective that is now going to be multiplied by every second derivative on the grid. So we'll replace rho here by rho effective for the nonlinear drum, where the rho effective will be of this form, which at all times, for all amplitudes, must be less than 0 0.5. Otherwise, the system becomes dynamically unstable. Do you have a question? Pardon me? Rho zero, you're going to pick to pick the frequency you want. Higher frequency means, or higher rho means higher frequency. Now, realistically, if you expect to have any tension modification, you can't set rho zero too high, or the sum of these will go above 0 0.5 and the system will die horribly. Which suggests a couple of things. One is, you might want to start out with a row of maybe 0.25. You also might want to put a max function on it, a min function on this, so that it never goes above 0.499. So once per time step, you're going to do this. Once per time step, you're going to do this. This you're going to do for every grid point on the on the drum. Yes. Yeah, it's the same thing because uh, you think that the higher row is uh, the higher the cell has to be. Or the higher C is. Yeah. So, so if delta T and X are fixed, you're really changing the speed of sound. You're not changing delta T. Delta T is fixed at 1 over 48 kilohertz. So you're not changing delta T, you're changing C. Since it's a product, you can't tell which one was changed. Right? It's just the product. And so I'm, I'm going to assign the change. I'm going to fix delta T and delta X in my brain. And then say all the variance in rho, all the variability in rho is speed of sound. And therefore, if you increase rho, you increase the speed of sound and therefore the pitch. Make sense? <coughs> what else? There's a MATLAB code that uh, writes this up in, in, uh, in some charming vectorized format that I have to relearn every time I do it. Uh, there's also a C code I wrote for the 
HPS that's linked up on the lab. You might want to look at that. The C code is what you have to beat. I could, with a linear drum, in other words, with row fixed, I could make the system go about 30 by 30 resolution. You could do a little better than that, maybe a factor of two, by going to both processors, although I don't think you could actually get a factor of two. And with, with row variable, in other words, with this formulation of row, the best I could do was about 24 by 24. What I'm going to ask you to do is a couple of things. One is to build a drum on the on the FPGA, which is bigger than you could possibly do on the HPS. I'm also going to ask you to see, try and figure out how the these various things scale as a function of size on both the FPGA and the HPS. And again, the goal here is when you push the button on the FPGA, you get a drum sound battle. The, the pitch of these, of these things, the acoustic pitch of these, when you actually build it, is going to be rather low. The little speakers we have in the lab cut off at about 150 hertz. I have four much better speakers for you to use for this lab. And you could test with them at least once in a while. You could also use earbuds. Do a little volume control before you use earbuds. Uh, but um, I have some speakers with uh, bass drivers on them that will get down to uh, 20 hertz or something for that thumpingly good sound. But that's down the line. The basic mathematical operation you have to do for next week is to get this programmed up for a 10 by 10 solver in model C. We'll talk more about how to do that uh, probably next lecture. How to parallelize this appropriately and efficiently. Again, any questions? Any questions about lab one? Now that we're at the end of the lecture. So. note over the weekend about multi-threading because you need to you need to be able to be always ready to get a user input and at the same time you have to be constantly drawing a waveform so you can either you, you you have to figure out how to wait for an input and not wait for an input There's at least two ways of doing this. One I didn't know until Jacob showed me, and that is to uh, use a, a built-in, uh, I guess it's a, a, a Linux POSIX function, yes? Yeah. yeah. That, that says, uh, uh, that knows how to detect if something is actually new on a, uh, on a, on a file stream. Or you can use P threads. This is not proto thread. This is not 4760. P threads is a POSIX linear, uh, Linux supported threading package with extensions for doing semaphores and mutexes. So I prefer that scheme, but you can use either one. Uh, Jake put up uh, an example of the of the using select. And I put up an example using uh, threads. But you have to be able to do both. Because we have input and wait. And not wait, excuse me, you have to do input, you have to 
which room put my foundation block? Question?